Amen. Good morning, church. It is, uh, it is so good to be with you all. And if you're visiting, I'm not a guest speaker. I actually do work here. Um, so excited to be with you all. And uh, wow, I, I tell you, I don't know if I've ever gotten emotional, felt emotional by a, about a Christmas song, but I did just then. Uh, well, let's give a hand to our worship team. What a great job. Um, also, uh, we had a great time for those that got to go to the Christmas party last night. Thank you, Tony, for putting all that together. That was an awesome time uh, th- that, that we had, and I saw many of you cutting a rug like we had never seen before. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. If you're visiting with us, we've been going through Mark this entire year. We'll be doing so. Our goal is to finish it up uh, at, uh, at, at Easter next year, so that's going to be our Sundays. Uh, yes, you're laughing. It takes a little while. We want to make sure we learn what we need to learn from, uh, from that and continue to be amazed at Mark. Let's remember why we started reading Mark was to be amazed by Jesus. And if you find yourself saying, oh, no, Mark again, I don't think you're getting the point. Um, it, it, Jesus is amazing, and he continues to do so every time we study him out, okay? Um, We're going to start in verse 38, just to give you a little bit of background uh, here. Jesus is kind of finishing up uh, this time. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's stopped in Capernaum. He's teaching his disciples and only his disciples. Uh, He's just, just last week, we talked about who, who, who is the greatest. The greatest is the servant of all, uh, welcoming in the least. Uh, As he brings a child to them, he says, you know, welcome a child uh, like this. He, He wasn't talking about a child. He was saying the least among us, that we welcome everyone, the least among us. And then he continues in this same, it's the same uh, the same situation happening. And, uh, and in verse 38, this is John's response to Jesus saying, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, receives me, uh, and whoever receives me receives not me, but he who sent me. He's saying you have an opportunity to receive God himself if you receive the least of these. And this is John's response. John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Not a great response when Jesus just talked to you about welcoming the least and, and, and you get an opportunity to, to, to receive God. They're not doing the right, they're, they're not with us and shouldn't be doing these things. Verse 39, Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, I'm sorry, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for Jesus and his example and even the challenging things that he says. I pray that we are amazed at his willingness to speak truth to these uh, men and to us, and God, I pray that you would be glorified by our worship of you today in this way as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Who here has a big Christmas meal planned? Anyone have a, a big Christmas meal plan? Nobody's really, nobody. everybody's done with Thanksgiving. Okay, so what if I told you at your Christmas meal there is no salt allowed? Oh, no, oh, no. One kid over here said yes. All of some, some of the older that need to stay away from salt are like, okay, I'll take it. But everybody else is like, no, that's not my Christmas. Uh, you know, the, 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 
But, you know, here, here Jesus finishes here. We're, we're starting at the end. Why are we starting at the end? Because this is Jesus kind of wrapping up what he's, he's about to move on in this passage. And he, and he wraps up this section here. And he says, everyone will be salted with fire. He's talking about the opposition that everybody's going to receive. And salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. You know, he, 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 salt has an amazing effect. It has, you know, it, it, we all want it to make food taste good, but it had a, 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 an effect back at that time. It wasn't just for seasoning, although salt, when it was, you know, the reason salt could lose its saltiness, it had various minerals and flavors and things like that in it that would that, that could go away, and then it was useless to be to be thrown out. And uh, and and but but you know, some people use salt in in interesting ways. I I've heard some people put it on watermelon and cantaloupe, which I'm like, who does that? I think only axe murderers and psychopaths do that, but, but I don't understand. The young, same young man that didn't want salt is not happy about it being on his watermelon or, or cantaloupe either. But, but, but salt, I did, do a, I did a little research. What does salt do? And it actually makes things that are bitter taste less bitter. That's why sea salt, chocolate, chocolate dark chocolate sea salt is so popular because it removes the bitterness of the chocolate. You put some salt in there, and people... Salt is, salt is something, he, he used this for, 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 for a purpose, having salt in yourselves. Don't, we, we are called to be salty. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Uh, the sacrifices in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 24, says, You shall present them before the Lord, and the priest shall sprinkle salt on them and offer them as a burnt offering to the Lord. It's meant to be an everyday part of our lives, not what we put on our food, but who we are. The effect of salt is it preserved. It, the things that would otherwise rot you use salt to preserve them so they can be stored for a very long time until you can eat them. Uh, th- th- that's, that's the effect that salt, that's the effect we are meant to have as followers of Jesus to be preserving, to be flavoring and, and giving, giving life to something that, that the world is dying. Everything is rotting. It's all going to die and burn except the things that get preserved by Salt, by us bringing Jesus and preserving that which might otherwise die. And Jesus in this passage gives us, he's been talking all along about various things, and he finishes up with these final two things that make clear how a couple of things that, that, that help us to remain salty ourselves. Not salty the way people use it today, okay? Not salty like that. If you're salty, you're going to, hopefully this helps you if you're salty in that way too, all right? Two, two points, two points today from this text. The first point is be, be tolerant of others. Be tolerant of others. So here is, here is this, you know, Jesus had, had taught them and, 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 and welcomed this child and and, you know, the least of them, welcome the least of them, and you welcome Jesus, but not just Jesus, but God, as I mentioned before. And, and, and you know, and right after this, Jesus, John, John pipes up, and he, he semi-asks this question about this person, you know, this person who's not with us, he's not in our crowd, he's not in the, the in group, the us 12, they, he was out, he was out, he's casting out demons, and I stopped him. I wanted to stop him. You know, it... it this person must have been a believer in Jesus, but he wasn't an apostle. He wasn't running in their circle. So John wasn't happy with what was happening. It's ironic that just prior to this, as Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John are up there with him, and they come down, and they find a man who the nine can't drive out a demon. And, and yet this guy, who's not an apostle, he's not with them regularly, this guy's able to cast out demons. Now, how that happened, we don't know. We just know he was doing it. He was having success at what the apostles couldn't figure out, which is, which I don't know about you, that kind of brings out a bit of a competitiveness whenever I see somebody able to do something I'm not able to do. I'm quite a competitive person. Competition can be a good thing, 
but in the context of our Christian lives, maybe not so much. Funny enough, I learned my, 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 comp, my competitive nature. I got it from my mother. She's incredibly competitive. She taught me how to bowl. She also taught me how to throw a baseball. And I ended, up, I ended up actually playing catcher. I had quite the arm, but you know how I learned to throw like that? Is my mother and I played burnout. Burnout was you, you got a ball, a baseball, not a softball, a baseball, and you threw it at each other as hard as you possibly could until the other person quit. That was me and my mother. Now, my mother, now at 72, she couldn't throw a ball. When she was young, that lady had an arm, and, 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 but, but it, it drove me to be better, and, and now the competitiveness comes out in not so good ways. You know, when we play, play cards as a family, it can get a little ugly, you know, but competition's okay, but, but unhealthy competition is what we see here in John. He's, he's shutting down the opportunity for somebody to be to be have a demon cast out from them just because they weren't with him. They weren't in their circle, so stop doing that. Now, some of us might think, well, I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, don't be so quick to say that. Because I, I think we can sometimes, you know, be intolerant of people that might do things slightly different than we do it. We have circles, okay? That's true. We shouldn't, we should all be one. Actually, I was talking to somebody just recently who said, oh, I'm, I'm so glad to be in the in crowd. I thought, oh, oh, man. I, I feel like, okay, we're, we got we to gotta fix that. I don't want anybody to feel like they're on the outside of anything. Because we, 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 we th- this, this idea of being intolerant is not how Jesus was except regarding sin, which we're going to talk about in the second point. Just give you a little, little preview there. But, but, but Jesus tells them clearly, if someone is not against me, they're for me. And, and this person was speaking for Jesus. And he was, he was basically just saying, stop, stop it, John. What's important is that Jesus is preached. That's what's important. How someone does it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether... and and and, and and this happens, I sometimes see this happen whenever people have differing opinions about how to evangelize or how to do church or how to do, you know, the only, to me, the only way, the only wrong way is don't do it. Everything else, man, is up for grabs. But don't claim your way is the best way and my way might be wrong. No, is Jesus being preached? Okay, then let's do that. However you do it, Knock your neighbor's doors or, or go to the 7-Eleven. I don't care. Neither does Jesus. It's when we get intolerant of each other and we begin to look down because we don't quite fit in some sort of, you know, specific way of doing things. If you haven't noticed, we got to change the way we're doing things as, as, and, and not, not, to, not to change and, and give in to sin, not to change and compromise the truth of the Bible, but we do need to be tolerant of one another. By the way, he's talking about those in the church. He's talking about followers of Jesus. He's talking to a group of followers about other followers. He's actually not addressing the world. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of different instances, actually, that we see similar things in the Bible. Go and study them on your own. In Numbers chapter 11, verses 26 to 28, Joshua was indignant when these two guys, Eldad and, and Medad, they were prophesying in the camp, and, and, and Joshua goes to Moses and, and says, hey, these guys, they're not prophets. They shouldn't be doing this. And, and, and Moses' response in verse uh, 29 of Numbers 11 says, Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Stop being judgmental. Is we, God would want everyone to prophesy. And similarly, in John chapter 3, John the Baptist's disciples had, had done almost the same thing when they saw Jesus' Jesus's star is rising and Jesus is baptizing. And, and in verse 26 of John 3, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. And John's response is, 
A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have set have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, his joy, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus, like Moses and like John the Baptist, refused to make them stop because good was being done. Lives were being changed. In fact, they encouraged anyone who spoke positively and wanted to pass Jesus around to continue doing so. What matters most is that Jesus in pre is preached and lives are changed. When we hear of someone trying to get, you know, trying something new to get Jesus to people, we should encourage it. We should in, go ahead, you go, show us how it's done, and, and, and let's, let's do something together. Let's be creative. Let's think outside of the box, because God doesn't work inside your box. God works inside his box, and when we try to, think, when we try to, to say, no, it's mine, no, no it's mine, no, you, you don't have the corner on that market. Neither did the apostles who walked with Jesus. Only Jesus has that right. It's so easy in our sinful nature to be like John, to be intolerant. Imagine how Jesus must feel with you and I. And all our, all our flaws, the mistakes I've made in my leadership, when I've been harsh with people in, in my discipling of them, my mentoring, or if I've been harsh with my wife or with my children, or when I've been unloving or uncaring when, when, I'm, when, I'm, you know, when someone is hurting or insensitive or, uh, or I've not listened or, 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 or you know, or just, just uh, not commended. You, you, I could just list all the things that I've done wrong, and yet... I'm still here. Jesus has been tolerant with me. I, can, I think about all the ways I've failed as a Christian in 27 years, failed time and time again, and yet I'm still here. Praise God for that. What if Jesus treated people the way John treated this guy? What if Jesus treated us the way John treated this guy? Whoa, it'd be, we'd be the whoa, whoa is you. But, but that's not how it is. Jesus shows us grace. He, show, he is the model of tolerance of people because they're people, they're souls. They need to be saved. They need to be changed. The word of God does that. And as long as they're getting to hear the word of God, that's what matters most. How tolerant of one another have we been? Have we tried to, have we gotten attitudes? And it's often not outward because you'd never say it out loud. Sometimes it's just in our hearts. I've, I've, exp I've, I've felt that way. When I hear of someone doing something a little differently and, uh, you know, I'll doubt it or I'll question it or in my, but never out loud because that would be not very nice. But what does God see? God hears our words, but he also hears my heart and he hears your heart. We need to be tolerant of each other and, 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 and full, of, full of love, full of grace, full of kindness and compassion, tolerant of others. But there's something Jesus is intolerant about, and that is intolerance of sin. Intolerant to sin. That's the second point today. The world today is really not much different than it was at Jesus' time. No, there were no mobile phones and, and all that we maybe see and get access to today. Um, some things have changed, but sin has not. Immorality has not. Impurity has not. The, the way that you might access those things has, but, it, but it's really not that much difference. The world wants us to tolerate sin in ourselves. 
I'm not talking about tolerating sin in the world. We can't expect righteousness from those that are not in the not part of the, not part of uh, of the world. And we should we should hurt for them and have compassion, not look down on or somehow put down. Okay, we 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 need to tolerate those those outside and 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 try to bring Jesus to them. But for ourselves, in ourselves, we need to be intolerant of sin in ourselves. The world and its standards have never aligned with God. The world is always trying to push the boundaries, and we feel it as followers of Jesus all the time. Open your phone. Would you be okay with someone looking at what you've been looking at on Instagram or listening to on Instagram? Or look on, go on your Netflix face. It's funny, I saw, I saw, maybe you saw this reel. Yeah, I do sometimes go on the reels. There's some funny things uh, on there. And I saw one that this guy goes to his wife and, and he's videotaping and, and he, he says, hey, honey, I'm going to look through your phone. She's like, okay, I, we're married. You're my husband. You, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at everything. And she's like, that, that's fine. And then he says, I'm going to look at your Amazon Prime list. <laughs> and she passes out. She passes out. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> someone's watching. Um, I'm not talking. That's not in my family. Not in my family. Never. We can talk about that later, but 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 this but Jesus the, the 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 point is God is watching. He's watching what we tolerate and what we need to be intolerant of. Mark is writing about Jesus calling us all to be intolerant to what causes us to sin, whether it be causing a child to sin by some way, because the child was with them. The child is right there. Or, or maybe he's referencing causing a young Christian, someone who's young in the faith, like that man that was made to stop casting out that demon, causing someone to sin. Or, 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 or the, the hand, or the foot, or the eye, which maybe you're sitting there thinking, um, my foot's never done anything uh, to cause me to sin. That seems a little odd. But th- this is what I read about that. It says, the hand, foot, and eye encompass the totality of life. The hand symbolizes what we do, the foot where we go, and the eyes what we see. Do our hands get us involved in things which are sin? Do our feet carry us to places which lead us to sin? Do our eyes lead us to areas of sin in our own hearts. Better to clean those things up in our own lives now from within uh, and, 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 and with the help of others as well than to have to deal with the consequences of the lake of burning fire, which was an actual place at this time. You know, at one time, there, there was a place outside of the city walls that was continually burning, Gehenna, and, and, and that's what he's referencing here, that, that that's, that's the pain and suffering for eternity if we don't repent. Does that mean we should, we, if we took this literally now, we would all be walking around with no hands and no feet and no eyes? Let's be honest. I don't think Jesus is saying that. Sadly, you can read some pretty gory history of some very devout people who actually did it. Cut off their hands and other things I won't mention here publicly to the point that actually the church outlawed it. That's how, because people thought, I will be closer to Jesus if I do this. Don't do that, okay? Just in case you, let me say it again, don't do that. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, deal with the heart. Deal with the heart. And he, and he takes this strong stand against sin and that's why we need to take the same stand against sin. And he's, and he's directing these things in this section at the individual. He says, your hand, your foot, your eye. Mostly all singular in this case. Not, not, he's not talking about all y'all dealing with it collectively. No, your hand, your foot, your eye. That it, it's vital that we cut out sin within ourselves. Unfortunately, what we sometimes see and we ourselves can be guilty of is an eagerness to point out the sin of others 
and, and be very assertive and, and, and indignant and righteously indignant about dealing with that sin in that person's life. When you just begin to scratch the surface and you quickly find out, wait a second, there's a lot more going on in their lives than there is in the people that they're so indignant about. There's a scripture about that. We all know it in Matthew chapter 7. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What's, what's sad is we can easily adopt the world's standards of tolerating sin. And our own tolerance of sin in our, in our lives is, is, is what we have to deal with. Now, we often need help. And this passage here in Matthew 7 says, don't, don't, it doesn't say don't address the other brother's sin. It says make sure you're dealing with yourself and then go help. So there is a need to go help, but we gotta, we got to deal with sin. And we become tolerant of sin in our own lives. Let me talk to those of us that have been around for a minute. Because I think those of us that have been around for, I don't know, I, I don't want to put a number of years. I've been here 27 years, and I know many of you from back then. So we'll just leave it there, okay? But generally, it's pretty easy to put away the, the outward things. Maybe not so much the anger, maybe not so much the frustration. As I get a little older and I have grandchildren now and I'm excited to see them, but I know I'm going to have to start going on a walk just because I can get a little bit impatient and, and because those sins of the heart are not so easy to deal with. And we begin to give ourselves allowances where God in his word does not give us allowances. Pride, anger, frustration, unforgiveness, hatred, complacency, greed, Got to prepare for retirement. Don't have the money to give to the church now. Got to get ready for when I retire. Well, that's true. You need to get ready for the ultimate retirement. That's eternity. That's not, that's not you know, Cocoa Beach or wherever you might end up retiring to. I'm not saying don't take care of yourself and be wise. I'm saying if we're tolerant of, of the sin of greed, retirement's not going to be very fun. You can have everything in the world, but if you don't have God, what does it matter? We used to be so hypersensitive in so many ways, in good ways, in, in radical ways, to repent and eager to confess and, 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 and to, to deal quickly with our sin and help, help one another. But no, can't get into each other's business now. That they won't find, I've been around a long time. They're not going to even say anything about that to me. We've got to, we've got to be very, we've got to, we need to pray. Let's, let's be praying. Let me, let me give you a challenge for, 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 for this, the rest of this year in 2024. Let's pray to have the sensitivity about our sin today and every day in the future that you had when you became a Christian. That sensitivity to I'm not tolerating that in my life for a second. I'm going to fast and pray and get help and be open, gut-level honest about what I'm thinking and tempted with because we can't tolerate sin. Because Jesus doesn't tolerate sin. For those that are younger in the faith, maybe you found yourself compromising and beginning to let your hands and feet or eyes cause you to sin in one way or another. It's time to get back to that sensitivity you had when you first became a Christian. I don't want to sin. I want to run away from sin. I want to get as far away from it as possible rather than saying, well, let's see how close I can get before I burn myself. Or maybe, maybe you're just so worried about what life might look like if you really did got, get rid of it. You're so accustomed to it. It's become kind of like your comfortable blanket that you keep close to you because, but because you haven't repented of it, you're afraid. What is my life going to be without it? That thing. And you know, I'm not going to try and label what it is. You know what it is. We need to get rid of it. We need to fight. Let's, let's, let's allow Jesus' words to, to, to cut it off, to gouge it out. 
to 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 throw it on to throw it on, to, to throw it out. Better to be blind or or footless or, or or handless, spiritually speaking. Get rid of whatever causes us to sin. Now, don't look at your spouse and say, "Sorry, you got to go." Don't say, "Don't do that." Don't do that. I know there was one or two of you that gave a nudge, that gave a little. I'm not sitting next to my wife, so she didn't get to nudge me. But, but it's time to run away from sin the way that Jesus directs us. Cut it off, gouge it out. Be intolerant about sin. Why did Jesus say all this? Because he understood the effect of sin. He understood that sin hardens our hearts, that sin causes us to no longer hear, to no longer listen to the word of God, to no longer, to, to no longer show compassion to others, to no longer forgive others for what they might have done to hurt us. We're so, we get so wrapped up in, in what, how we feel and how we're hurt that we're forgetting about how God feels and how God hurts. Because that's what our sin does. And just another reminder, he's talking to his followers. He's not talking to the world here. He's talking to those of us that are following Jesus. Have salt in ourselves. We're called by Jesus to be the salt of the world, preserving and bringing flavor to a world that is dying and rotting away. Do that by being tolerant of each other. Tolerant of those who might not not, not be like you or do things the way you do them, but they're getting Jesus to the world. Be tolerant of them. Let them do it. Don't stop them. Tolerate people full of grace and truth just as Jesus tolerates you and I. He doesn't shut us down, though we don't do things perfectly. We still get to bring him to people to help them and see their lives change. And be tolerant. Be tolerant of each other, but don't be tolerant of sin. Get rid of it. Be radical because Jesus was radical in his call for all of us. Get help if you need it. If you're here today and you aren't sure what all this means, why is he talking so much about sin? I'm not even a member of this church. Ask someone to study the Bible with you and show you how Jesus forgives. Jesus is so tolerant. How Jesus wants you to get convicted about your sin so that you can repent and be baptized and have your sins washed away. That's the goal so you can get to Jesus and have the ultimate of retirement in heaven. Jesus tolerates us, and he wants us to run away from sin because it will destroy us. We don't have to live with its eternal consequences because we've been set free by Jesus himself. Don't let it creep back in and allow our hearts to get hardened. Deal with it quickly. Deal with it daily if necessary. Don't tolerate sin Let's allow Jesus to have his way with us as we live out the salty lives he has in store for us all here in Hampton Roads. Amen. Thanks so much. Amen.